Hey, what's going on everyone? Greg here, and it's pretty clear at this point that Apple is fixing their biggest mistakes, or rather, mistake. And we can trace most of the faults to one single product, the 2016 MacBook Pro. The 2016 MacBook Pro was a sleek product, it was thin and light, weighing about the same as a 13-inch MacBook Air, and was even thinner than the MacBook Air at its thickest point. But that device moved fast and it broke a lot about what consumers and pros loved about Apple's laptop lineup. So let's go over this because I'm going to go over what I think are Apple's biggest mistakes and how they've been working to fix them, not only in their present products, but in rumored future products as well. And I'll also be in the comments section with you for the first hour. So drop a comment and do me a favor. And if you're like most people who watch my content regularly and don't subscribe, consider hitting that subscribe button to get even more videos like this one. And if you're a longtime viewer, hit the like button because you know this video is gonna be good. Okay, it could be average, maybe bad, but hey, you're here for some reason, so I assume you like me for some reason. It's the eyes, right? My mom always said I had nice eyes, so we'll go with that. You are, you are now, now experiencing. Right. Anyway, let's get into it. Now, I think a lot of these mistakes can be traced back to the 2016 MacBook Pro, like I mentioned before. One of those mistakes was the butterfly keyboard. Listen, I am a self-admitted fan of the short travel on the butterfly keyboard, but it's impossible not to consider the overwhelming opinion that they went too far or too short, and that the keyboard travel wasn't enough for most people and created an uncomfortable typing experience for long typing sessions. And that alone would be cause enough to get rid of the keyboard for most people. But the biggest failure of the butterfly keyboard wasn't even that it had short travel, it was that the keyboard was literally failing on people with keys that would get stuck or would repeat characters when pressed. And infamously, the keys could be broken by a single crumb or a piece of dust, prompting Apple to include a guide on how to clean your butterfly keyboard with a can of condensed air. And Apple tried to fix the butterfly keyboard with at least four revisions and even had a four year replacement program for new laptops with the butterfly keyboard. The butterfly keyboard stuck around until it was replaced on the 16 inch MacBook Pro with the new and I guess old magic keyboard, which reintroduced the classic scissor switch mechanism and basically solved all the issues that the butterfly keyboard introduced. And this was really the first of many steps of Apple trying to fix what they broke with the Mac lineup. But something that hasn't changed quite yet, even after the replacement of the butterfly keyboard, is the touch bar that first appeared on that same 2016 MacBook Pro. The touch bar is a small strip on the top of the keyboard that replaced the function key row and gave us an OLED screen that could change the keys to be different shortcut buttons, symbols, brightness and volume sliders, emoji, or using it to skim through videos. The touch bar itself may not be a complete failure, and I have found several uses for the touch bar that I personally like. But the touch bar also, I think, doesn't have any diehard fans, and Apple has not done enough to keep updating the touch bar concept and actually giving us more benefits and reasons to use it and fall in love with it. It's basically been the same concept since 2016. On the recent MacBook Pros, they even shortened the influence of the touch bar by removing part of it to fit back a physical escape key. So the touch bar's influence has actually been diminishing rather than growing since 2016. Secondly, it's an expensive component that doesn't add much value to the MacBook Pro. And I think most users would be fine if it disappeared tomorrow and in its place came a regular row of traditional function keys like we still have on the MacBook Air. In fact, recent rumors suggest that Apple is indeed looking to do just that and remove the touch bar from its next redesign of the MacBook Pro and giving up on the idea entirely. The port situation on these MacBook Pros would also be an infamously poorly received decision. Sure, this MacBook Pro introduced us to the four Thunderbolt ports, which have been a staple on almost all modern Macs now, and yes, 
these Thunderbolt ports are actually amazing and pretty fast. I think Windows laptops should also be criticized for not supporting this amazing IO enough, which can connect super fast storage, powerful 5K displays over a single cable, and also charge the laptop and even support things like external GPUs. This is a very powerful connection. But with that being said, Obviously, the all USB-C port future we were promised in 2016 isn't necessarily a reality with many connections still supporting other standards like USB-A, HDMI, DisplayPort, the SD card slot, and so on. The biggest culprit of this port removal to me remains the removal of two ports. One, the dedicated MagSafe charging port and the SD card slot. MagSafe was great because it was just used for charging. And while I love having the ability to charge my MacBook Pro through the USB-C ports and being able to charge that on either side of the device, and I hope they keep that as an option if they're bringing back MagSafe, it's also great just to have a dedicated charging port so you don't have to waste one of those precious and limited connections on your device. Think about it. The MacBook Pro at most has four USB-C ports. If you had to charge your device and use it at the same time, which was probably what you had to do a lot of the time on those old Intel MacBook Pros, you would be taking up one port and be left with only three connections. MagSafe was also just a really safe and secure way to make sure that your laptop wouldn't go flying off the table if someone accidentally tripped over the wire. And who hasn't had that happen to them? Actually, I haven't, but... It's always nice to have a safeguard. The SD card slot was also a super convenient and easy way to transfer photos and videos from dedicated cameras. And a lot of people didn't like that Apple got rid of that card slot. Although most of us nowadays just take pictures on our phones and most people don't even put in an SD card to transfer photos or video files from a bigger camera to their laptop. We're talking about the MacBook Pro here and the MacBook Pro is used by a large audience of professional or prosumer photographers and videographers, a lot of which still use an SD card in their workflows. So that was a big loss for consumers like that. Again, recent rumors suggest that Apple is planning to bring back MagSafe and the SD card slot to a future revision of the MacBook Pro. And it's just another decision we can trace back to the 2016 MacBook Pro as not really being that popular. And it looks like Apple is indeed working to fix that mistake as well. And I hate to pile on the 2016 MacBook Pro here. I think the problems in this product were exacerbated, but this is a problem that most Mac computers had at the time. And that would also be Intel's fault in a way because we have to acknowledge the less than stellar thermal performance of these thin laptops, which was especially brought to our attention with the 2018 MacBook Pro, which suffered from thermal throttling, and that was a problem exacerbated with the first MacBook with a six core processor, which initially led to some pretty poor thermal performance that Apple slightly fixed in a bug patch, but still, when you loaded up the tools to track the processor cores, and while running various benchmarks, you could see that Apple was not able to utilize the multi-core design at what would be expected out of a higher-end Pro laptop, especially on that 15-inch version. Now, yes, Apple made their laptops thin, and that in part deserves some blame for why we got to this point in 2018 with laptops that just ran way too hot and had fans that sounded like jet engines taking off. However, Intel deserves some, if not most of the blame here, as we can trace much of Intel's issues also back to 2016, when they were trying to transition their chip design from a 14 nanometer design to a 10 nanometer design. These chips should have been more power efficient, but Intel failed on bringing these 10 nanometer chips to market. And still, to this day in 2021, they are trying to ship Ice Lake 10 nanometer chips, which were supposed to be out in 2019, then 2020, and now are apparently going to be here in the first quarter of 2021. Why does this matter? Apple at the time thought that they would be getting these 10 nanometer chips and therefore they would have lower power chips and they designed their MacBook Pros 
with that change in mind. Smaller nanometer chips mean smaller transistors that would lead to an increase in power efficiency, leading to less power consumption, and that would lead to things like longer battery life, as well as the amount of heat that these chips would generate in this thin enclosure. Apple itself was already developing its own chips, which were becoming even more power efficient on the iPhones and iPads. I think Apple thought at the time that Intel would keep pace with their chip development, but Apple, it turns out, was able to leapfrog Intel in chip design. This is what led to the decision to now replace Intel CPUs and transition to their own custom Apple Silicon chips. The first of which is the M1 chip, which is built on a five nanometer process while Intel is still struggling to ship 10 nanometer chips in mass volume. Now Apple has an industry leading mobile computer chip and a desktop chip. And if you've watched any of my M1 Mac reviews, you know that this processor leads to amazing thermals, can be put in laptops with fanless designs that barely heat up, come with multi-day battery life, and they're just super fast and snappy. In fact, if we start to add all of this up and look at the Mac platform in a broader view, Apple's biggest mistake since 2016 was their overall inattention to the Mac platform. Most of these problems really showed up in that 2016 MacBook Pro line and onward, but it was a general inattention to the Mac itself from neglecting an update to the Mac Pro since the 2013 redesign, a design that was largely unpopular with its target audience because it lacked a big enclosure where parts could be easily swapped out. This also marked Apple getting out of the display business in 2016 and Apple neglecting to give us a visual facelift to the iMac. Apple also kind of forgot about the MacBook Air and tried to replace it with the lower end MacBook Pro and also tried to fulfill that role with the underpowered 12 inch MacBook and, and so on. There's so many problems we can just trace back to that 2016 era where it feels like Apple just neglected the Mac. But now with the latest fixes to the new M1 Macs and new rumors about ports returning in future updates to the MacBook Pro, the iMac getting a redesign hopefully, and Apple developing a consumer external display, and let's not even mention the amazing performance and efficiency gains they have achieved with the M1 chips, which have just brought so much excitement and enthusiasm back into the Mac platform. Now, I haven't been in the game that long, I think, but I have never seen such positivity for Mac products since running this channel. And I think the excitement level about not only the current entry-level Macs, but these future higher end Macs is just off the charts right now. The current products still may not be perfect. And honestly, they might never be. Products always have problems and there's always room for improvement. But it seems that Apple has fixed their biggest mistake, neglecting the loyal Mac customers, most of which have built careers by using their products. And these people carry tremendous influence and have some of the loudest voices in the Apple community and the computing industry as a whole. It still remains to be seen if Apple will fix some of the issues I mentioned in this video, but right now the future is looking bright and I am just as excited as all of you are. All right, everyone, hopefully you liked this video, and if you did, be sure to give me a big fat like. If you wanna see more from my channel, including coverage on some of these future Mac products, make sure you subscribe. Also, let me know in the comments below, do you agree with me that Apple is on track to fix their biggest mistake by neglecting the Mac lineup for about four years? Let me know in the comments below. I would love to see what the discussion is down there. And as always, if you wanna help the channel out in any way, make sure you check out some of the links in the description. And as always, thank you so much for watching and I will see you all in the next video. Take care, everyone.